Hello, my friends, and welcome to Philosa Gaming. Now, there's no arguing that Bioshock is a game that took the gaming world by storm in its time, with a unique and overarching art style, dynamic FPS gameplay. And the integration of crazy superpowers in a gritty, druggy setting—it was the kind of thing most players hadn't done before, unless they played Bioshock's spiritual predecessor, System Shock. And on a personal note, the fact that bees are a superpower is one of my favorite things in the world. But Bioshock's long-lasting claim to fame is not its straightforward critiques of utopian philosophy, but very specifically a unique. Critique of Ayn Rand's social, behavioral, ethical philosophy, so-called objectivism. But before we start, if we want to see how Bioshock had us engage Rand, we need to understand a little bit about Rand, her philosophy, and her reception in the philosophic community. Now, before we begin, this is going to be a pretty long video. There's a lot I want to discuss, so I'm going to separate it into three sections. The first is going to be an actual history to Ayn Rand, just a little bit of background to get to know her a bit and evaluate her separately from the video game. The second section is going to be some history of Bioshock, so that we're all on the same page as to what led up to the game. And the third is going to be Bioshock's engagement with the philosophy. If you're already pretty knowledgeable on the first two sections, go ahead and skip to the third. I'll see you there. Ayn Rand was born Elisa Zinovenia Rosenbaum in Saint Petersburg, Russia, in February of 1905, into a bourgeois Jewish family, and that demographic offered her an interesting position living through the Russian Revolution and Civil War, and she opposed both the communists and the czarists in that conflict. She attended Petrograd State University, where she studied philosophy, law, and philology, which is essentially linguistics with focuses in literary criticism and history. She studied ancient philosophers as well as modern. Like many philosophers in her day, Rand put an emphasis on creating systematic connections between different areas of thought. Rand completely loathed the Russian system of government, and in 1925, when she obtained a permit to visit relatives in the United States, she committed herself to never returning to her home country. Rand held that philosophy was only important in so far as it is necessary to have in order to make a good human life and create a world conducive to living. Also, that philosophy is intrinsically linked to success, in that if one's philosophy is generally correct, the person will be generally successful. For the most part, as you might have guessed, Ayn Rand had theories in many different areas of philosophy, and in the annals of philosophers, Rand is what can best be described as a divisive figure. She commands a very significant cult following among lay people, especially here in the United States, but is highly criticized and almost vilified among scholars. What we will be focusing on, and surely what Rand is most popularly known for, is her social ethical system, which she called objectivism. Objectivism, as Ron states, is in essence the concept of man as a heroic being, with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, and productive achievements as his noblest activity, and reason as his only absolute. With just that, one should start to be wary of the problems of hedonism and man's inability to agree on what reason or rationality are absolutely. But let's not judge books by covers. The next step to an overview of Ron is her theory on ethics. Ethics is defined as the values that guide choices and actions. Very simple. The ultimate end to any ethical system must be survival. Anything that could improve man's survivability is thus a noble pursuit, and that could range everything from the necessities to luxury to feeling good about things. However, Ron's morality isn't primarily important. Survival is important. Morality is only important if it helps man survive. If not, don't be moral. But in some of Ron's less convincing argument, her philosophy holds that every moral act, whether individual or pointing toward human flourishing, necessarily results in survival. So don't worry about it. If you choose to live, then you must value your own long-term survival as an ultimate end, and morality as a necessary means to it. The degree to which Ron dismisses the importance of morality and redefines its discussion from how she defines rationality and survival has led many to conclude that Ron's philosophy is actually amoral, though amoralism was never actually claimed by her. Jean-Paul Sartre has a number of things to say about philosophers whose arguments lead to amoralism, but refuse to accept it. 
but we're not talking about Sartre, so let's move on. The most controversial part of Rand is how she depicts some values that most of us would call virtues. Benevolence, forgiveness, generosity, charity, and generally any value of altruism are only good if one is serving their own self-interest and survival. It's this strain of argument that tends to earn Rand's philosophy the reputation as holding selfishness rather than rational self-interest as the ultimate value. Essentially, we should only take such actions if it makes us feel good. But should any group or government urge such things, it is only a limit on us as actors. But what is never rational is to sacrifice what one finds valuable to themselves for anything of less or no value to themselves. Other people, bums, as the first chapter of Atlas Shrugged uses liberally, usually fall into this category. As it is harmful to one's survival, it is always irrational and therefore incorrect to risk one's own life for another. Think about what that means for something like a standing military. Ron describes altruism as courting unhappiness for the happiness of another. Charity is itself particularly improper en masse as Ron believes it necessitates that we sacrifice our convictions to the convictions of others while being made to feel guilty for wanting to pursue our own. To Rand, charity, in the traditional sense, motivates imperialism, dictatorships, as well as laziness and entitlement on the part of those who don't contribute to society, while harming those who do. It can be said that this part of Rand's philosophy is a very extreme version of the those who do not work do not eat principle, and is likely a reaction against the ideals fostered in a communist state. Rand does, however, hold that charity itself is a virtue, and we'll discuss that a little more in a little bit. This expression of altruism has earned Ron's philosophy the reputation of being very elitist among its critics. While those who feel overburdened by their responsibilities to others feel a sense of relief from the guilt felt in pursuing their interests, critics point to a gross oversimplification of altruism and other ethical philosophies under umbrella of abject sacrifice. Critics point to how her philosophy reasonably ignores the challenges faced by the elderly, the handicapped, and the disenfranchised in society, that it makes no room for people's duties toward rearing children while denying systems of personal or governmental charity that could fill that role. And Rond defends, rather weakly, in my opinion, that as long as two men are following rationality qua survival of the individual, then giving what the other merits will never impede one's own self-interest though the definition of merit seems to heavy-handedly exclude what many people see as common sensibility, giving them no place in society. Let's take charity as an example here. When talking with a Rondian on Twitter, they provided me with the definition of charity. They used Oxford's the voluntary giving of help, typically in the form of money, to those in need. Ron called charity one of the virtues, but not a major one, so she put some limits on doing charity. First, it must be the person's choice. They mustn't be forced into charity. Well, the definition already states voluntary, so nothing new there. She says that one should never make sacrifices, surrendering something of value to oneself for the sake of something less or of no value to oneself. So let's apply that rule to charity. To do charity, one must provide a need to someone else. So let's say I have a bottle of water, and the person in front of me is dying from dehydration. I assume I want the water, why else would I have it? And let's assume I feel nothing good from giving it away. But charity is a virtue, so I'll give it to him, but I must receive some benefit in return. I mustn't do it for nothing, and I mustn't lose something by giving up my water. So I'll determine that this water is worth $50 to me, or perhaps even $2. I tell the man I will give him the water if he pays me $50, or $2, whichever example you want to use. We voluntarily agree on the exchange. I have thus performed a charity. But wait, that doesn't sound like charity. That sounds like capitalism. According to Rond, this is charity. But is it really charity? Is it charity if I am paid to do it? Or to turn the phrase, when he pays me to fulfill his need, do I do him a charity? Well, Rond might say, in defense of her common-sense ethics, that any person who ignores the need of a dying man is in fact a psychopath. It doesn't look like I ignored him in my example, though. I just pursued my self-interest as Rond defined it. Ironically, this capitalism leads us into Rond's politics. 
Rand depicts the moral society to be one that is ordered by the trader principle, which says that a society should be a collection of independent individuals that respect each person's natural rights to life, liberty, and property, and trade value for value, with all people being honest and having personal integrity in the measure of these values. Essentially, everything, not just commerce, follows the principles of capitalism, with no one ever swindling, overcharging, or raising profit for profit's sake. And everyone who is rational agrees necessarily on the fair worth of a thing. All natural rights are negative, in that it focuses on people's non-interference with the pursuit of those rights, rather than positive, which would be any form of provision of those rights by the government or society. Rand holds that individual rights are the means of subordinating society to moral law, and that the state should only exist as a minimalist framework for creating a strictly laissez-faire capitalism. That way, man can be unrestricted by systemic charity or unnecessary taxes. And she held that for a brief period, America came close to capitalism in its true form in the 19th century. But true capitalism has yet to exist anywhere. The underwater city Atlantis from Bioshock takes the place of Ron's utopia from Atlas Shrugged, which existed as an anarchic system of individuals living a Rondian society who have a judge for settling disputes, but because they are rationally self-interested in the proper way, never have need for this judge in any significant form. The question is: Could such a society even exist? And if so, for how long? It is the intersection of Ron's ethics and her politics that becomes the subject we engage in from the very first moment we begin playing Bioshock. In Bioshock, our story begins once the story is already over. Rapture was supposed to be the promised land for the skilled, talented, and determined, one where every person was already the elite of the elite, people who lived for their own happiness and the empowering of their individuality. But as with any society, some win. Some fail. Conflict happens between rational people, and we show up to see the full force of a revolution sinking Rapture into anarchy. When we arrive, Rapture seemed to have gone to hell only days, maybe even only a day or a few hours before we arrive. After all, if the news of the destruction had gotten out, I doubt there'd have been any first-class commercial airlines offering a complimentary in-flight cigar and a glass of scotch for a transnational flight over this wonderful city. As we go through the story, we learn bits and pieces of the political wheelings and dealings of what was going on. Andrew Ryan escaped from communist Russia, became a successful American industrialist, and, along with a few other super citizens, built Rapture in secret. Then, seemed to just vanish from society when they officially picked up their bags and moved. For a while, everything was going great. The science got done. They made some neat guns, and they ate cake. But then they discovered Adam inside sea slugs and its ability to manipulate. Or alter DNA in order to make superpowers. Only silly, wrongly moral people from Washington or the Vatican would warn against pursuing science that could benefit humanity at the cost of changing DNA. So they were all in. The product was a hit. Everyone wants it. Everyone is getting it, and they can't keep up with demand. By happy accident, however, Doctor Tannenbaum discovers that if the slug infects a host, A.K.A. little girls, they produce ridiculously more atom than before. Seeing drastic change in DNA and supposedly behavior, the people of Rapture no longer saw the little sisters as humans, and thus they no longer needed to respect their humanity. Now we have human farms. Three cheers for societies where individual happiness and success determine whether or not you are correct and rational. The company responsible for discovering Adam and harnessing it was Frank Fontaine's Fontaine Futuristics. Fontaine's business was the wealthiest in Rapture. He had complete vertical control over all factors of production of his genetic-altering drugs. If it weren't for the smaller competitors, Sinclair Solutions and Andrew Ryan's Ryan Industries, Fontaine would have had a complete monopoly. Ah, but not all was well. See, Fontaine was cheating. His fisheries that discovered the slugs had been smuggling illegal goods in order to finance his business. But wait, according to Rond, correct philosophies lead to success, and incorrect philosophies lead to failure. Fontaine was the most successful business owner in Rapture, so he must have had a correct philosophy. So it wasn't wrong to smuggle. But oh, wait. 
Fontaine was supposedly killed in a shootout during one of Rapture's police force's raids on a fishery. But oh wait, that police force is actually Ryan Securities, a company owned by Andrew Ryan, who was then given all of Fontaine's business assets after he died, because the city council, which Andrew Ryan is a part of, voted to give those assets to him. So that means because smuggling didn't ensure his survival, Fontaine must have been wrong. But his success means he must have been right. But oh wait! Andrew Ryan became the most successful businessman in Rapture by supposedly killing him and taking Fontaine's company. So Ryan's philosophy must have been right. And thus it was right for Ryan to have killed Fontaine, who was also doing the right thing by smuggling, because that made Ryan successful and thus philosophically right. Right? Well, many of the citizens of Rapture didn't see it that way. They thought nationalizing Fontaine Futuristics, then giving it to Ryan's private ownership, was crooked and a denial of individual liberty and property. So they revolted and created civil unrest. The people who weren't in the revolts were afraid to go out. They bought more weaponized plasmids to protect themselves from protesters, then locked themselves up and stopped engaging in commerce. And Andrew Ryan, head of Ryan Securities, decided to convert Fontaine's department store into a prison to stop the protesters who are interfering with the individual liberty and property of Rapture's other citizens. By New Year's Eve 1958, only seven years after Rapture was completed, they had a full-scale civil war, all Rondians, all fighting for what they saw as the protection of their individual liberty and property from those who oppressed it. While racing through Rapture, the player not only gets to learn of the city's collapse, but also encounters unique and successful citizens of Rapture through finding discarded audio recordings along the way. The player gets to see bright-eyed idealists working only toward their own happiness, their own sense of accomplishment and productive work, without any limiters of systems of morality that say that those things are not the only worthy considerations. And the player also gets to see these same people fall into the natural conclusions of their work, and that is their work eventually consuming them. But what about the player? Knowing that our society was so far flung from what Rapture eventually became, how did Bioshock get us to engage with this world and learn its reasons? Now let's get down to the details of how Bioshock engaged Ron's philosophy. When we think of games that try to engage morality, what comes to mind first? For most, the answer is choice. You have the obviously good choice and the obviously bad choice, and they either slightly vary the story, or that character that unfolds, or create a completely opposite storyline entirely. A good example of how these choice systems usually work is the game Infamous, or any of its sequels. But Bioshock goes with a completely different direction. First, Bioshock gives us a drastically different character to play as. Other games that engage moral choice will go with characters that are essentially blank, like in the Elder Scrolls and Fallout, so that the player has freedom of choice without cognitive narrative dissonance. Craft whatever character you want, see a bunch of outcomes, and have a ton of scenarios. Or they will go with establishing characters with their own personalities, and things they value, but not an established code of ethics. This can be seen in games like the Infamous series, which, come to think of it, I should do an episode for since it has a pretty interesting way of expressing fatalism. Bioshock, on the other hand, puts you in the head of a character that already has his mind made up, has completely figured out what the best way for himself and the world to be is, and he's decided that Rond is where it's at. The very first line of the game is our character's internal soliloquy. He says... They told me, son, you're special. You were born to do great things. You know what? They were right.
Essentially, the game developers decided, yeah, we're going to let you control this guy, but you players are going to see his world, a Rondian world, play out. Not yours, when fate happens to crash your plane right on top of this hidden underwater city. What is particularly interesting about the character establishment is that the game leads the player to identifying as the character through creating an illusion of choice that is similar to other games, but is ultimately not an impactful presence in the game world. The main moral choice is in killing or curing the Little Sisters after murdering their silent submariner guardians, the Big Daddies. The kill option is supposed to benefit you more by giving you more Adam at the expense of killing an innocent person. That innocent person is not the little sisters, but the big daddies. But doing so fits your own personal goals and well-being, and such selfishness is the only reason to justify the disconnect between outright murdering a child's protector for the sake of saving that child's life. To cure her is supposedly to be self-sacrificing, selflessness, that is harmful to the character in the mind of the player, in the short term. Because after curing enough little sisters, you get a bonus of Adam that evens it out in the long run. Perhaps to point out the benefits of benevolence that aren't immediately recognizable to those who find this version of self-interest as a positive value. The long run bonus, however, makes the difference of choice irrelevant to the story in the long run. Because when you first make these choices, you are completely unaware of the future benefits. In the end, your character is still performing the act of initiating aggression at a person whose only mission is to protect children from a world gone to hell. You could choose not to fight them and not get any powers, but you won't make it far through the game. In fact, you'll die right there, actually. In other words, our character is entering this apocalyptic world in pursuit of his lofty goals. He thinks of himself as objectively greater than all those people he left behind who let themselves be limited by government, charity, and wrong morality. He believes he is entitled to do whatever he wants to pursue his goals, and he crosses that door completely willing to kill innocent children and kill innocent protectors and only saves them in true Rondian fashion of charity if he, or should I say we players, are made to feel good by saving them and then, in the future, made to seek a greater benefit for saving them. Unwittingly, Bioshock makes us take on the life of a true Rondian, making whatever degree of control we try to have over the character necessarily fall into that philosophy. But our character is special in a way. It is understandable why the Rondian philosophy is so appealing to him, because it is a very productive philosophy for our social context here in the U.S. of A., but the character isn't living a Rond philosophy in the United States. He is entering the nation Rond envisioned, taken to its logical end. What we must see about Bioshock's criticism is that the setting puts Rond society through the greatest test imaginable for any model of social order or utopia. It takes the structures of the society and exposes them to true anarchy, mob rule, and despotism. And the particular genius was in getting to that point by letting all of its characters live Ron's ideals 100% until they finally hit that wall that forces some of Ron's ideals and optimisms to conflict. Any government must be able to have balances by maintaining order, having systems to facilitate a degree of change and revolution, and also present fairness on a grand scale. In other words, society must account for the others. There must be children for the next generation, and people to raise them and educate them. For every lofty idealist with a new idea to change technology, mathematics, industry, etc., there is manpower making it happen, systems and logistics that need solutions and innovations. There must be ways to care for the people who have already given their lifetime of work and have thus earned their place in society. In fact, there are so many considerations to make that the society from Atlas Shrugged, where all of the so-called best people of society decide to leave and do their own thing without restriction or duties to others, is far beyond unlikely. It's irrational. In my opinion, the model that Bioshock employed was extremely effective for a game looking to shine a critical light on ideas that lots of people take for granted. There are many social philosophies out that make the claim that if only we did X, Y, and Z, all of our problems would be solved. But in pursuit of such claims, 
these philosophies tend to fill themselves with ad hoc explanations for things that their perfect systems couldn't account for. It is a foolish rule that has no exceptions, but a rule that always needs exceptions is just as foolish. A good ethical philosophy isn't one that merely says what specific things must be done or should be valued, but creates a framework by which we can actively evaluate that for ourselves, and together as a community, fluidly tackle new problems as they arrive and in their time. It is because of this ability that philosophic schools like utilitarianism and Kantian philosophy have lasted for so long, and are able to use the insights of other philosophic perspectives to inform them. The strength of the scientific branch of philosophizing is that it seeks to create the tools for finding truth, not in asserting that their understanding of science creates one undeniable truth for all. As you might guess, I'm not exactly a fan of objectivism or Ayn Rand. Rand popularized her ideas in fiction first and foremost. That creates problems for scholarship. Her work lacks self-criticism and logical argument, relying more on the reader's emotional engagement with her characters to convince people. Being fiction, readers can draw their own conclusions about what Rand means, making asserting Rand thinks blank or Rand thinks this to any given person a challenge. Once she got critical attention, she continued to defend against criticisms with ad hoc arguments in articles and interviews and responses to fans, but didn't reconcile these answers with views expressed in her fiction. But she maintained that it was there. It was years after Atlas shrugged when we finally got something that appears to be a philosophic text. But she got there through fame, not through proving herself to the philosophic community. How would we receive a scientist who got their fame for writing stories, not for proving themselves to the scientific community, and then try to tell us that all Euclidean geometry is useless? Should we receive a philosopher who claimed all of her philosophy is based in science in the same way? I also loathe her depiction of the concept of rationality by claiming that her philosophy comes from pure fact and rationality, from science. And then any rational actor will inevitably lead to her own conclusions. This gives her followers an excuse to end discussion. Rand has the facts. Agreeing with Rand means you're rational. Thus, if you don't agree with Rand, then you are irrational. If you are irrational, then Rondians have no reason to keep talking to you. You are a lost cause. You are not one of the Atlases. So it is fair to shrug you off. Anyone who criticizes Rand will hear one sentence first. Have you ever read Rand? And if you say yes, but still disagree, they will say, "You don't understand Rand." Quicker to question you than they are to hear your argument, and quick to drop the conversation when you present counterarguments. And yes, this is an overgeneralization. I admit that. But having talked to dozens of Rondians, I have yet to hear one person break this mold. So my bias has been firmly established in my experience. I even had one person say I couldn't understand Rand from only reading summations of her work, then immediately provided me with a summation of Rand's philosophy written by an unashamed Rand supporter. A degree of hypocrisy in that. Her work does have academic merit, but the means she employed in crafting it and expressing it made it fall into traps of self-contradiction. And enough ad hoc explanations that it soon got to the point where it stopped prescribing any sort of change or means of evaluation, and just became a statement of saying everything just is the way it is, and here is my hermeneutical lens. I think the best overall criticism of Ron's philosophy, however, is summed up well in this quote: "It attempts to deny ourselves a desire to nurture and empathize with other human beings by placing ourselves at the center of our own interests, to the exclusion of everyone else in our larger society." However, I do believe Rand has many views that are worth entertaining to inform our own views, and I'm not going to claim that Bioshock perfectly tackled Rand at every turn. In this video, I only covered the means Bioshock employed to engaging with Rand's philosophy. So, in the comments below, let's discuss where Bioshock failed or succeeded in addressing some points of Rand's objectivism, or share with us your experience playing Bioshock. Were there any moments you felt true weight in the process of making a choice, or share anything else you'd like? Thank you for watching, everyone. Feel free to share your thoughts in the box below on any topic. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more in the future. And if there's any game or topic you'd like to see featured in a future episode, let me know. And I look forward to you joining us for the next discussion.